Good everyone. Welcome to episode 144 of the Trade Mate Sports Betting Podcast. Today I'm joined by professional sports better Neil Shah. Welcome back, mate. Yeah, it's good to be back. Uh, good morning, good evening, wherever you are, whatever time it is. Yeah, just thought we'd change it up today, get you back on, mate. It's uh, just, uh, yeah, we're really, really uh, revamping things. Run out, run out of budget yet again. <laughs> big time big time uh mate we're going to do something very very different today and i think this is the first time ever i've essentially had to do no planning for the podcast ever it's been left up all up to you mate so you might as well you might as well host today yeah yeah i suppose might as well yeah uh we are it's it's christmas time mate and this was your idea we thought you know people are trying to find gifts for their friends, their family, maybe. I mean, all the people that listen to this, maybe, maybe you just want to buy a, a present for yourself, and uh, and what better present than a than a book, a, a sports betting book? And it's probably it's the one that comes up the most, I would say, in all the you know people that I listen to, YouTube channels, podcasts, whatever. They always kind of say this is the one of the best books out there. It's called The Logic of Sports Betting by uh, Ed Miller. And Matthew David, I'll just get up the actual, um, this is what the book looks like, if anyone's not seen it before. Uh, if you're on YouTube, you'll be able to see this. Um, but, yeah, mate, we're going to do a book review. How exciting. I actually I actually haven't read the book. Now, this is the, the, which is a slight problem, uh, just a slight <laughs> problem. As, as host of the podcast, you would think maybe I'd read the book. I thought um, you were going to bag it, Alex, the whole way through. Yeah, no, no. I'll be honest with everyone. I'm not. I'm not going to bullshit my way through this one. I have not read the book, but our uh, our trusty guest here, Neil, has read the book. Um, and and I guess Neil, mate, you can. Um, we've got a list of themes here, a list of chapters, I guess that that Ed and Matthew go through. And yeah, we can just discuss them. Um, I guess you can go through come some of the key points that they go through. Obviously, not going to go through the whole book. But, um, yeah, just some of the key points and maybe give you guys a bit of a taster and, yeah, a general discussion, I guess, and maybe we can uh, give our two cents on all the things that they talk about, mate. So, your yeah, I think this came to, out two years ago. I can't remember yeah, when you said you've like read that. it. It's very recent. Yeah. What are your – what are just your general thoughts? Before we go into, like, the nitty-gritty, your general thoughts on the book, like what kind of uh, level you think the book is – geared towards um yeah and how much you liked it disliked it yeah sure so um i actually downloaded this as an audio book um a while back maybe about a year ago um and you know it was a good listen and i kind of enjoyed it but i think um i suppose it depends on how you learn stuff i mean i kind of um i suppose i didn't take in as much as i probably should have done by listening to it so what i really wanted to do when i spoke to you was to have an excuse to just go back and read it again. So actually, um, you know, Ed and Matthew, you know, you've got decent royalties from me because I bought it twice. Um, <laughs> and but but the, but I definitely definitely am really glad that I I actually bought the paperback version. You can get it, you know, on on Kindle. You, there's a few you know, sort of different methods, but for me, you know, just getting it in paperback and actually kind of scribbling notes in and rereading it, I think is one of those books where. You know, it, it, it's, it's accessible, you know, um, the, lot, the, there's, you know, there's nothing overly complex in terms, you know, there is some math in there, there is, um, you know, some uh, some of the theory, it, but it doesn't ever kind of veer too heavy. Uh, but, the, it, you know, it's quite a short book, relatively, I mean, uh, you know, compared to other things I've read at university, you know, about 200 odd pages. Um, but there's so much kind of gold in there. There's so many nuggets of insight. Um that it is something that you know you you might want to kind of you know you come back to. So this is definitely a book I'll have on my bookshelf. Um, I'll you know I'll have there as a reference. There's some brilliant lines in there, um, kind of maxims to live your betting life by, I guess. Um, yeah, in terms of sort of the level it's pitched at, I, I would say uh, you know it's probably not suitable for a complete beginner to betting. But to be quite honest, you know if you're listening to us right now um you, you know I, I i don't think you know most of our audience that they you know they have some you know good knowledge about betting they they understand markets they understand prices things like that um it is 
sort of geared towards an American audience. So obviously that terminology in there is American odds, um, you know, parlays instead of accumulators, um, you know, the other kind of interchangeable uh, terminology. Uh, a lot of the examples are just kind of US sports based. There's lots of examples from um, the NFL, um, you know, some examples from uh, basketball as well. Um, so if you're, you know, if you primarily bet on, on you know, real football, soccer, um, <coughs> there's no, there's not that many examples there, but you can, <coughs> excuse me, um, you know, you can easily kind of translate what they're saying about other sports and, you know, it's kind of um, transferable um, to every sport, really. Um, so, yeah, I think it's a fascinating book. I think it's definitely worth a read. I think anyone who's um, serious about taking their sports betting, you know, to, to a better level, to kind of to get more precise about it. If you're someone who enjoys the process, especially if you're someone who enjoys the process of finding your own bets, uh, finding your own angles rather than sort of just copying tipsters or, um, you know, whatever's out there on Twitter. If you, if you want to actually kind of, let's say, originate your own lines to kind of really go in depth, this is a great starting point. Um, you know, it doesn't give away, you know, all the secrets, but it gives you enough of an insight where, you, you know, you can come up with your own ideas. If you have your own theories already, um, it gives you enough of an insight to really hone down your process and really find good angles um, because it's really focused on how sports books operate. And if you understand their business model and if you understand, you know, where they're strong or where they're weak, um, you know, you're in a much better position to to actually you know, to, to be profitable. Yeah. Uh, and what's their background, mate? I'm not too familiar with them. I haven't really. Uh, haven't yeah, so Ed, uh, Ed Miller is a poker genius, uh, and Matthew Davido is, um, I mean, you know, they're, they're men of many talents. Uh, but, you know, he has a background in sports modeling. They both run uh, Deck Prism Sports, which right. um, I, um, I think I did. <laughs> I applied for something there a while back. Um, but, you know, they wanted to American citizens only. Uh, but Ed, you know, was very nice, got back in touch with me, sent me a very nice re reply. Um, but, yeah, so, that, so their company is kind of primarily based on providing uh, in-play um, odds, uh, again, providing data for, you know, major betting companies in the U.S. I believe they may have been looking to sort of build their own sports book. It may be that's, you know, that's already come to fruition as well. But, um, you know, both of them got... A lot of experience in the industry um, and again you know that it's written from that perspective of people who understand sports modeling who understand how sports books operate um, and you know presumably you know very sure are both you know very successful uh, professional betters as well yeah all right cool mate I think that gives us a good general overview of what the book's about uh, and the authors themselves so why don't we dig into some of the, the key topics or themes from the book. The first one you highlighted was the importance of holds or VIGs in betting markets. So for those who don't really understand what we're talking about, it's basically like the, the margins that bookmakers put on their odds. So easiest example is you'll never see, <clears throat> you'll never see the line for a basketball game, a soccer game, whatever, you'll normally see at 1.9 in odds on each side or uh, what is it in America, minus 110 or whatever. Yeah, yeah. So um, instead of 50-50, two on each side. So reason for that is because of the hold or VIG that they take from that betting market. That's how they make their money mostly. But, uh, yeah, mate, what's the uh, yeah? what do they talk about mostly in that section of the book? Yeah, so lots of interesting things, uh, you know, things that lots of your guests have, have discussed before, but, you know, still worth repeating. Just because the difference between, let's say, you know, retail uh, bookmakers and market makers, you know, and how they differentiate in their hold. So, you know, lots of people um, listening to this will, will have heard of Pinnacle, for example, you know, who would be considered, you know, one of the leading market makers. And generally, they would a lower hold, a lower margin on their bet. So generally the prices would be um, sometimes more attractive, but also they're hard to beat because the lines will move fast. 
Um, and, you know, if smart bettors, you know, get a chance at the beginning to pick over those lines, um, you, you know, you might be kind of late to the party. So um, that's kind of a key key thing there really is just to try and explain where the the retail soft books, you know, in the UK, we call, let's say, high street bookmakers, you know, the William Hills, the Bet365s, um, you know, the Ladbrokes of this world, and Neds. Um, so, you know, all of those kind of bookmakers, they do have a higher hold because really they're, a lot of the time, they're just kind of copying what the market makers are doing. So they're watching what, you know, what, what the lines kind of open at, and they peg their odds to the lines of the market makers. But, um, you know, what's interesting in the discussion about the book is basically seeing how you can use that to your advantage. And it's very much, you know, the, the theory behind trade mate. Again, you know, tying to pinnacle odds. Again, if there's, if there's a movement caused by sharp betting action, the soft books are slow to, to pick up on it. So, you know, you can overcome that hold. Um, but something really interesting, uh, I suppose something that I... I I don't necessarily do that much, but something, you know, I should, probably should be doing. And I think something you talked about as well, things like uh, middling and creating synthetic holds. So, for example, in you know, in American sports, you might have a point spread uh, on a basketball game or an NFL game, you know, one team minus seven, you know, another team, again, you know, plus seven. And so you can kind of create situations where, you know, you can either create free bets for yourself or you can create situations where, again, you reduce this hold, this margin from the bookmaker by trying to spot these opportunities. So, th so the book gives you ideas on how to do that, how to go about doing that, and trying to understand, uh, you know, how the bookmakers price these things so you can spot these kind of opportunities. Um, so that's something, you know, really interesting, something that's referred to a lot in the book. And it's the core principle, really um you know, that they talk about essentially you need to overcome this hold you need to overcome the margin it's not enough to you know just be right more than wrong you know you need to be right more than wrong plus whatever the margin is you know if, if it's a if it's a 50 50 shot bookmaker like you said they're not actually giving you a genuine 50 50 um you know odds display so um you know you've got to be far more right um, to get it mm. but there are different markets where the hold is higher so um you know where there's uncertainty on the bookmakers um behalf then you know the the holds will be higher but that doesn't necessarily mean that they're harder to beat just because yeah. the hold is higher and i think that's one of the key kind of uh, things in the book so comparing let's say kind of standard money line 1x2 markets you know a team to win uh and looking at prop bets and derivative bets, bets that kind of stem from those original lines, but are slow to move or, you know, again, there, there's added information that you might have um, and that you might use that to your advantage. Yeah, I, I'll never forget the one of the first guests I ever had on the podcast, Matt Howard, stuck out to me. He's a, you know, been director of sports books, you know, just worked on, basically just worked on the other side of the fence for a very long time. And that was one of the big things he said to me. He said, you know, the bigger the margin, basically, the dumber they are. So the bigger margin that they stick on an event means the less confident they are in their odds. So even, you know, you might go to a sports book and see 1.8 on each side, 1.85 on each side. That's a pretty bloody big margin. But that's essentially them admitting that we don't really know all that much about this market, so we're going to cover our asses and, yeah, stick a big margin on it because if we're, if we're very wrong, at least, then we won't be as, you know, we won't be exploited as much. So, yeah, that's a really good, really good point, mate. And I think what you mentioned before about, um, I guess, looking at the sharper markets and, and saying, yeah, they might have the better odds but there's a reason they have the better odds. It's because they're, yeah. a, they're a lot sharper. And I think that's probably a trap that a lot of, a lot of sports bettors can get, yeah, can get stuck on basically is that, yeah, it, it's, it probably is the smartest idea to bet with a sharp bookmaker more than a soft bookmaker because generally you're going to get the better odds. But there's a reason that they're sharp bookmakers and you want to make sure that you're a bloody sharp sports better if you're going to be betting with them 
predominantly and it kind of goes back to i mean i don't want to i don't want to sit here and plug trade mate but it's a good it's a good principle to go by i guess is that if even if you're not using trade mate if you're making your own prices uh yeah if you're just betting by yourself and going off your own opinion or maybe you have your own model or whatever and if you see that a soft bookmaker has the best odds in the market like and then the sharp bookmaker is a lot lower and you're just looking for that that's like a little bit of confirmation that you can get that all right maybe what i'm seeing right now is is um is correct because if the sharp bookmakers you know already got lower odds than a soft bookmaker that's essentially like the sharp the sharper betters bet with the sharper bookmakers so the bookmaker is lower than the soft bookmaker i mean that could be that last little you know confirmation to make you pull pull the trigger on a, on a certain bet so i think that's uh maybe just a good general principle for people to go by that if you are making your own prices and you're just like oh i'm not 100 percent sure on this but i really like it and then you go and see that pinnacles at, at 1.9 but bet 365 is at two probably a good little trigger there little principle to go by that um can just yeah trigger the bet for you yeah absolutely and um you know and and you know on, on that point <coughs> so the uh you know the, the, the way the shops as well kind of how they set their lines i think that's another kind of key point in the book is that you, you i don't want to badmouth anyone on twitter but we all know what gambling twitter is like you know there's some uh uh people making it you know, with lots of opinions uh some of them more valid than others uh but you know you see lots of people out there shouting oh this is value this is value you know, this is a value bet and they'll post up a bet on the saturday morning you know of let's say a premier league game you know the, the arsenal game that afternoon um and you've got to think to yourself when did that line start you know when when did the bookmaker when did the market maker put up that price on that game it wasn't on saturday morning you know it was earlier on in the week um, and, you know, and in the book, they mention things like, for example, NFL lines, right? So you've already had, by that point, you've had all the smart bettors, you know, they're, they're kind of refreshing the page. They're waiting for these lines to open up. They're trying to pick off the sharp bookmakers, you know, then the lines move. They've moved from the sharp, sharp bookmakers. So there's already been a lot of movement. And then by the time it gets to you, let's say, and you're betting that soft book on a Saturday morning, all these sharp bettors, you know, they, they've they've had their pick, you know, they they they've kind of um, cherry picked the, you know, the, the you know the best fruit from the orchard, and um, you know you're you're left with scraps, right? You're, you're 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 what you think is value, you need to be careful about because there's lots of people who have passed up on that price, and then this is kind of um, a way to look at sports betting. I think a lot of people when they're starting out, I. I, I count myself in this as well you know i think don't understand the market mechanisms and how markets are fluid and they'll move through the week and they'll, you know lines will be kind of pushed in certain directions so um you know it's important to see you know what the movements have been um i know there's different um theories on this i know there's guests of yours uh, you know who are adamant that look they think the price is this and if it moves out and if it drifts up um further it's not a sign that they're necessarily wrong. It's a sign that, you know, that actually there's more value for them and they can take it. So that's, you know, that's, that's another perspective on it. But I think the book here is saying actually, um, perspective here is if it's kind of moving out, then maybe, you know, your judgment wasn't right on this particular bet. You know, maybe there were other factors you hadn't considered. Maybe your model, um, you know, didn't, didn't factor things in, you know, because we talk about closing vi line value a lot. And if you're beating the closing line, because really you want the market to move in your favor, in your direction more often than not, that's a sign that other smart people are doing, you know, what you're doing. Um, the market is, you know, trending towards um, a kind of consensus, uh, but you're on the right side of that consensus. So I think, I think that's a really, really important point. I think it's something that, uh, again, if you want to take your betting seriously, you need to be looking at markets far earlier. You need to be kind of having an idea of the price. You need to be, um, finding ways of using the information available to you, or you need to be quick, um, you know, with, with changing information to kind of exploit that as well. Yeah, and I, I like what you said about 
um, if the if the market's moving against you, there's something you've missed. Because there's been lots of times just in my own betting on MMA or whatever that the market will just <clears throat> rapidly move against me when I've, you know, let's just say I've locked something in at 220 and next thing I know it's closed at 240 and I'm like, you know that's that's fucking annoying. Like knowing that <laughs> that you've uh, you've had such a strong opinion on something, but the market just hasn't moved with you. Good example of that was um, just something that uh, a bet that's come up this week actually. And I mean, I'm giving everyone a free tip here, probably <laughs> uh, people who don't subscribe to my channel. But um, I I was doing I was doing some research and analysis on a fight. Uh, Jordan Levitt versus Matt Sales. Just no one probably knows either of these guys, but um, I, I just I, I noticed that Matt Sales hadn't fought in two years. I was like, oh, okay, I wonder why he hasn't fought in two years. You know, normally fighters fight like three times a year. So I just typed in Matt Sales and you know looked at all the news and stuff. And a YouTube an interview came up on YouTube, and it had seventy five views. And this guy basically. <clears throat> that detail that he's had like the most horrendous run of uh injuries he uh he fights at 145 pounds normally but he during that two years he shot up to 250 pounds um and it i mean normally fighters don't tell you this sort of stuff but this guy was just like he was laying it all out on the line had a kid lots of injuries you know shot up to 250 pounds so i'm assuming that he barely did you know i'm assuming he hasn't improved all that much with his fighting like uh or anything he might have declined and um and he's going up in weight class because he hasn't been able to take all the weight off yet so it's like all these you know massive red flags for this guy um and that 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 interview's got 75 views on youtube like because he's a very low level fighter in the UFC, not that popular. It was I think I watched it on Monday or Tuesday, so it's earlier in fight week. And these are just great examples of I know I don't know how many views it's got now. Maybe it's getting closer to a thousand views by now. But I knew that Pinnacle, all the sharp book, every bookmaker. There's no way that that's factored into their odds. It's got seventy five views. <laughs> So, I mean, there's no articles about it, nothing. Um, and I know that potentially by the time Saturday kicks off, even if it's got a 1,000 views, there's no way that that's even barely, you know, factored into the to the line as much as it should be. So um, a, a great example. I mean, maybe, maybe, you know, the fight, you know, I know there was one last week, like I mentioned, I think it closed at 2.30 and I got on at 2.20. Maybe there was an interview or some like random piece of news that I had no idea about that I missed throughout the week. So um, if, 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 the, if the price is good, good, another general principle to go by, if the price is far, far, far away from what you think it should be, there's probably a good reason. Like you almost want to pick up on little edges rather than massive edges because massive edges probably means that you don't, you're missing something big. Yeah, I think that's a brilliant example. Like you said, like if you know, let's say what seventy-five people watch that. Out of those seventy-five people, how many of them are, you know, going to be betting on that fight? And out of those seventy-five people, you know, let's say I don't know, 10, 10 people might be betting on that fight. Out of those ten, how many of them, you know, actually stake properly, understand prices? So that's that's a massive edge in itself, and it, yeah, totally. You know, it's about information sometimes. Getting information, like you had a, a guest on, and I I forget his name, uh, but he specialised in college basketball. Was it college basketball? Ah, uh, yeah, college caps. Yeah, and again, like you know, through his kind of sources, through his network, you know, sports books can't they can't keep up with like hundreds of teams, you know. So if you yeah. if you have contacts who can kind of confirm, you know, someone's injured, someone's out, so, you know, he, yeah. I think he mentioned something about watching a video of practice, kind of similar to what you're saying, you know, he watched a practice video online and again, it barely got any views, but, you know, he, he knew how to use that information properly. And that's... that's Tony Alvarez is another good example, gets 10 years. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, so so the, these kind of micro edges, when you add them together, might not sound like a lot, but like you're saying, you know, if he can get you a few percent, that's huge long term 
you know, and, and that and that's what you should should be aiming for. But something yeah. they mentioned here, actually, then I can kind of ask with relation to UFC is kind of the factoring in public money. So because I suppose, you know, UFC fighting sports in general, in terms of liquidity, in terms of, you know, market volume, um, you know, there's maybe, you know, a bit smaller than some other sports. So, you know, does that skew the prices sometimes? Is Are there uh, fighters who are kind of overhyped? You know, maybe they've got more yeah. slick marketing and, um, you know, people who don't really delve into the, the data um you know and they're kind of con consistently overrated is that something you find definitely a thing like three four years ago like conor mcgregor's I had probably it's probably i think the last fight actually it was the first time i i just i noticed the market finally got over his hype because <laughs> um <laughs> I think uh, I can't remember, but Dustin Poirier I think closed at like one point seven, uh, something like that. Whereas uh, and he opened, it opened basically as like you know even even kind of fight. And normally, you know McGregor's odds, if anything, shorten just because he's the most popular fighter in the world. But yeah, I mean, good example was like three or four years ago, he was fighting Khabib Nurmagomedov. It was it's essentially just striker versus wrestler, and most people know that when it's striker versus wrestler, the wrestler just about always wins because they can always take the striker down and beat the shit out of them. So that, that, that I mean, that's a very general way of looking at mixed martial arts. But I mean, the odds were essentially uh, one point nine on either side, and yeah, that was. I mean, McGregor might have even been favourite. I can't really remember, but I remember betting on Habib and just being like, "This is just ludicrous that that Habib is is not a." massive or at least a decent favorite in this one so yeah i mean hypes i think it's something that's phasing out now definitely i think uh, i think people have noticed <clears throat> now that that was a bit of a trend so yeah definitely a couple of years ago if you were up uh, if you were well into mma and uh yeah you get certain fighters that are hugely hyped i think there are still examples of it today here and there but it's pretty it's pretty it's pretty rare but i mean back to sorry back to what you were saying before about um about team use, Spanky, uh, that's, I remember Spanky saying on a podcast one time that I, either how he got started or something that he did throughout the middle of his career is he would, um, he would call up certain, I think like college, college basketball, college football um, teams and, and pose as some like alumni or like, you know, some <laughs> past student or yeah. something like that and be like, oh, man, I love this team so much. I watch them every weekend, blah, blah, blah. Man, is this player playing this weekend? I'm I just I'm stressing out about it, et cetera, et cetera. Like I just I just want to know like how the how the, how's the team shaping up this week? Have they trained? Oh no, I think he's that, that was his question. I think did uh, X player train this week and all this kind of stuff. Like I mean, it's genius stuff because it's not it's you know if you're a sports better, it's not something you think of at the top of your head. Like I'm gonna call up some you know college team and pose as some like past student alumni whatever. And, That's uh, brilliant. And, and, and it's my like Anthony's <laughs> story as well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh god. If anyone and hasn't heard that, that that one of the funniest stories. Uh, oh. Yeah, is that we'll have to post it yeah. in the comment. If you, uh, if you, I've got it on my Twitter. I, I posted two clips of Anthony's story about his one of his worst beats ever. Um, <laughs> it, it was probably about two, three months ago. If you scroll through my timeline, I don't really tweet too much, so you'll be able to find it relatively quickly. It's probably the greatest sports betting story of all time. <laughs> That's brilliant. It really is brilliant. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, that's the thing, you know, look, anything to to get an edge, it's all about marginal gains, you know, it's, you've got to apply that to football. Remember when um, there was this big fear of, you know, this controversy when uh, Liverpool appointed a coach just for throw-ins, you know, <laughs> um, and, but but it was a stroke of genius, you know, like it led to, to, to more goals, led to more attacks, so these are the kind of, you know, marginal gains you have to do and the same thing as sports betting and that kind of relates to another point of the book that um you know it's a kind of truism it's a cliche that people say oh you know you beat the bookmaker you know beat the bookies um you know or smash the bookies if you're taking this seriously and i think you know let's say i'd like to think i'm not saying we're you know, a, a huge level yet but you know we're getting you know better as we go along um, you know, I, I would say I'm I'm trying to compete against other smart betters. 
I'm, I'm trying. It's a multiplayer game, so I think that's also something that people um, maybe you know don't realize or kind of uh, perceive as as you're battling the bookmaker. But actually, the soft bookmakers, you know, uh, with a, with a good set of knowledge, you know, you're, you're able to pick off lines fairly easily. It's not. You know, it's an open secret, you know, the methods you can use to do that. Um, consistently beating the market, the market makers. Um, if you're doing that, you know, you're beating off other competition. You're getting in there first. You know, you're picking over lines, um, you know, at a similar kind of time, you know, to, to a kind of select uh, group of people. So really, you need, you need to be framing it as, you know, how can you compete against other smart people in this space? Because... Again, if you sometimes if you take a bet, but you know you don't, it's not going in your direction. Means other smart, uh, you know, betters aren't necessarily looking at it. Again, maybe there's something in your process you need to think about. Um, so that's something quite enlightening, I think. You know, just kind of seeing that it makes a lot of sense to me. I think it's um, you know where you should pin yourself again if you want to be doing this professionally, if you want to be doing this seriously. You know, there are other people in the markets on the exchange, you know, betting at these soft books. They're moving lines all the time. There's giant syndicates, you know, that you're going to be up against as well. So it's really important to see it as a multiplayer game, uh, you know, and, and not kind of you against the bookie kind of uh, proposition. Yeah, no, 100%, mate. Um, let's let's go on to another topic. You briefly mentioned it before, uh, creating middles and zero hold markets can you i mean can you kind of explain like what kind of depth they go to in terms of creating middles because i think this is a this is a really i mean it's a very 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 good way to make money from sports betting but it's it's pretty complicated like at least for someone like myself i'm i'm not very good with maths i'm not very good with numbers so like creating a middle it, it's it's pretty time consuming for someone like myself. Do they go through any like, I guess I mean maybe it's just rep repetition, like you know doing middling every day. You do it over and over enough, you're just going to get bloody good at it, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But is there any like quick tips do they give on like um, I guess just getting getting better at spotting middles and stuff like that? Yeah, I, um, there, there's lots of examples, uh, again, from US sports. And, and the good thing about the book, you know, there, there, there's lots and lots of examples. Uh, things are repeated, you know, and I think it's important. Some some of the key points are kind of repeated throughout. Um, examples of different point spreads, um, game situations where you might find something pre-game in play, um, you know, where you can kind of tie the two sides. Um, one interesting point, you know, in, in the book as well is uh, that... The, the, there's an argument to be said for basically betting one side of the middle. So if you if you find a situation where you know let's say you I suppose create a free bet opportunity for yourself, or you know you you find uh, you know by having kind of two bets, um, it's essentially a zero percent hold or a very small um, margin for the bookmaker. Um, you you know it it might be a better idea sometimes to actually bet your opinion, you know, what what you think, uh, you know, of the two will actually happen rather than kind of creating the uh, the middle rather than arbitrage where you're locking in a profit. But at the same time, you know, this could be quite slow, tedious. Um, I mean, I, I, I suppose I, I'm not familiar enough with US sports books and kind of how, how they look upon this. But, you know, at least I know for sure, you know, they hate it in the UK. Um, and it's a very quick way to kill your account. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's something I suppose, uh, it, you know, in, in the book, they don't really mention, they don't really talk about kind of account limitations and how to prevent it or kind of strategies to do that. Um, you know, but that's, you know, there's plenty of other resources online, you know, to plug for TradeMate as well. You know, on the website, there's, you know, there's lots of uh, ideas on there and our software as well. Uh, but yeah, I mean that that's quite interesting because I know when you did a video on that as well, you know, when you kind of create those opportunities. But um, what what I found interesting was basically you know this argument that you should try and pick one side, you know, favor one side of the middle rather than yeah, okay. both. And uh, yeah, I think I think that's quite interesting. But again, it's it's um, for some people that might be tricky. You know, this transition from maybe match betting, arbitrage, and kind of secure. Uh, safe profits 
um, essentially you are taking a risk. But the idea behind this is if you're betting, even if you bet randomly into markets with a, a zero hold, um, you know, or a very small hold, you know, if your opinion is good enough, you can overcome that margin and you know, you've got a good chance of coming out on top in the long term if you consistently do those kind of bets, but kind of, you know, bet them in favor in one direction. Yeah. I mean, you probably should have mentioned too, for those who are listening and don't know anything about middling, it's basically, uh, let's just say uh, you got over under on a, on a football game is <clears throat> maybe less, you know, I'm going to use rugby as an example. It's just easier with the points. Uh, the over under lines, 40 points and you go under 40 points earlier in the week and then the line drops to 38 points or something like that and you bet the overs. So it basically means if there's 39 points in the in the game, then you're going to win both of the bets. So it's a pretty big edge. I mean, most of the time it's not going to happen, but when it hits the middle, you win big, et cetera, et cetera. Um, a good example actually was... Uh, in the in the uh, NRL, and you might see promotions. I'm not sure if they do this. Maybe in others. Maybe they do it in like. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised they do it in some of the US sports, or maybe even in soccer. Is they'll do a. Um, uh, it's probably it's very hard to do in soccer, especially if you don't have Asian lines. But um, they do like two dollar or two point zero lines on each side. So um, they do this for the rugby league here in Australia at one particular bookmaker off the top of my head uh, as they do, you know, let's just say Cowboys are playing the Broncos. Whoever's the favourite, let's just say you've got a slight favourite of the Broncos. You can get two, 2.0 for the Broncos minus one and a half and you can get 2.0 for Cowboys plus one and a half. So if it's like you mentioned before, it's a zero hold market. If you pick the right side, you can uh, and and the market moves with you, then you can bet back the other side, and uh, and you can have a very very good middle there. So, um, that's a really good example. They did it last season. I think they've done it for a couple of seasons. That uh, for Australians listening, Ned's Ladbrokes and Betstar, they're all the exact same bookie uh, owned by the exact same company. So what I was doing was, um, I mean, they obviously. Once once they look at your account, they're going to be able to see all your action at every single bookmaker. But if I'm backing Cowboys plus one and a half at Ladbrokes at two in odds and then the, the line moves in my favour and then I go back and then later in the week I bet the Broncos uh, minus two and a half or whatever at, at two <clears throat> at, at Neds or Betstar or whatever. Um, then you're definitely getting two on either side, which makes it even more profitable, which basically means that even if you don't get the middle, you're going to be $0 if you bet the exact same amount on each side. So, um, yeah, there's a uh, there's a good little example for everyone. <laughs> definitely, yeah, a really, really good example. And, it is, yeah, it's a great sport, you know, especially – you know, like you said, with with football, it's a bit trickier because it's a kind of low scoring sport. Um, you know, you don't get the that, that range of spreads. Um, yeah, you know, exactly. And uh, because it's so liquid, you know, maybe it's you know it doesn't move so fast. I suppose with um, smart action. But again, yeah, basketball, rugby, you know, American football, um, they're all kind of you know interesting sports to follow with, with that kind of thing for sure. Yeah. Um, all right, mate. Uh, we are 40 minutes in. Why don't we pump out another topic here? We've talked we talked about a lot about just betting markets in general. Um, maybe uh, maybe we can – yeah, this, I think this is a good topic to go to. Uh, why props or, you know, proposition markets in betting are good and why, like, markets like, you know, 1x2, money line are quite tough to beat. And maybe this leads on to, like, where bookies are weak and where they are stronger yeah so there's a great phrase in uh, in the book about attack surfaces you know uh, if you can't imagine you're at, at war with the bookmaker um <laughs> you know they're, they're they've got their castle walls and uh, uh i've been watching loads of sort of like vikings and last kingdom stuff that's in my head you know like imagine you know where, where how are you going to get into their fort how are you going to uh you know you're not going to charge through the front gate you know the front gate is going to be 
the one X twos, the money lines. That's their <laughs> strongest area. You know, you, you're going to yeah. try a batting ram; it's not going to work. You know, the archers are going to, you know, decapitate you from from the top of their towers um, because you have to think like a bookmaker, and you have to think like um, someone who works in marketing for these bookmakers. What kind of bets do people do? You know, if you know. You know, I don't like the phrase mug punters, but you get, you know, let's say, you know, just the average punter, the average Joe, what kind of stuff do they bet on? You know, they're, they're going to be betting on a team to win. They might bet on their favourite team, you know, to win every week. Or uh, or they might, you know, at a push, they might bet on goals. Um, they don't really go into, you know, huge detail on, on, on these kind of side markets. But the bookmakers, um, you know, essentially, and I'm sure everyone kind of can relate to this, Sometimes you go on these bookmakers' sites and they kind of look the same. They're getting odds provided from, you know, the same people. Um, There's nothing really to distinguish a lot of bookmakers from each other. You know, it's the same kind of thing. So how do they retain customers, especially soft books, right? Because market makers, you know, they don't need the publicity. They don't need the marketing because smart bettors will flock to them because they know that they won't get limited and they can actually get some action down. But... You know, the average high street bookmaker, the average soft book, uh, they, they need ways to stand out from the competition. So what they'll do is offer lots of these different markets. They'll say, oh, you know, we have 500 markets you can bet on on this Chinese basketball game. You know, uh, most people aren't going to bet on any of them, you know, but, but it's something they can kind of say, you know, they can buy in or um, it looks good you know, to have this kind of this betting menu with all these choices. But it, and the other thing is, you know, having kind of worked in the industry and kind of knowing people who work in the industry, you know, working for a bookmaker, it's not the most lucrative option. Um, you know, if if you are good at sports betting, you know, maybe this is going to be a controversial thing to say. <laughs> maybe this will kill my chances of, of <laughs> working in the industry in the future. But, um, you know, the kind of salaries on offer compared to if you have a successful process and your bets are working, the kind of yeah. exponential income you can make, as long as you can get your bets down, it doesn't make sense. So the what the, the problem bookmakers have is that, you know, a lot of the most talented people are not going to be working for them. They are the competition. Um, and kind of going back to this point about, you know, attack surfaces, you know, they... Um, you know, the kind of regular customers, kind of bets they go for, these 1x2 money lines, that's where the resources are going to go. So bookmakers are, you know, kind of uh, staff are overworked, you know, they'll kind of add things onto people's plates, you know, they might get graduates coming in and they'll be like, oh, you know, you do the uh, Chinese basketball, you know, and they might have like a spreadsheet with some totals, with some data on it, and they price their lines without a huge amount of effort. But obviously, if there's people betting hundreds of thousands, you know, millions on Man United to Liverpool on the weekend, you know that given the choice, given the allocation of resources, the bookmakers of resources are going to go towards high-profile events, mm. um, you know, towards events where, again, they can return the most profit. People betting kind of small amounts into prop markets, into these derivatives, it's not going to be the main focus for the bookmaker. So that is an advantage and that's an opportunity for people to exploit because there's not going to be the same amount of effort going into making those lines. They're not going to move as fast. Um, you know, they're, they're, with a bit of research, with a bit of information advantage, uh, you know, you can be quite profitable. The only drawback is at a certain point, you know, uh, you the, the market limits for those kind of bets are smaller. So, you know, that, that is the problem that you, you would face further down the line. And that's why maybe some of the serious bettors don't look at that. You know, they, they put their efforts into trying to beat you know, bigger markets. But in terms of, you know, I would say most people listening to this, um, you know, that's not a problem you'd necessarily face for for a long time. But And the kind of bets, maybe I should be clear as well, what we, I mean by kind of prop bets, derivative bets, so, you know, what we mean by money line and one X2, a team to win, um, you know, or even goals bets, for example, would be, you know, a big market. But the kind of props would be, let's say, um, a player to have, um, you know, you know, even a player to score, uh, a player to have a shot on target, 
Something that I like to do a lot is player passes. Uh, someone who's exceptional at this, uh, Adam Cheng, uh, you know, who's who's been on the, uh, the the podcast before as well. You know, that's that's a real edge. Um, so you can find these opportunities in different sports. You know, if you follow them, if if you know that this bookmaker is kind of let's say buying lines in, you know, they've got a data provider, they're not putting the same amount of resources into those markets, then you know, you've found an opportunity. Um, you know, but you know, the more high profile the bets, the more people who are generally betting into a market, the kind of more efficient it's going to be. That kind of makes sense. Uh, so it's going to be harder to beat. You know, there's just lots of movement, lots of consensus in the market, and long term, it's tougher for you. Unless again, you have a specific advantage. For example, you know, Tony Alvarez with uh, with the team news that he gets. For example, you know, this is information that perhaps will come even five minutes before you know the rest of the public are aware of it. You know, that is a huge advantage. So it. You know, unless you have something like that, or unless you've got kind of an exceptional data model that's overlooking something that everyone else has, which is yeah. possible, but it's really hard to do, um, you're going to have a tough time, you know, long term beating these markets. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a good, and it, it, I think it's a good uh, starting point for anyone who wants to take this a little bit more seriously. They're probably going to first look at Liverpool versus Manchester United 1x2 market. Don't. Just, just like if you really want to actually like spend five hours a week, you know, improving your sports betting and trying to originate something, yeah, spend some time looking at prop markets uh, and whatever sport you're interested in because a lot better chance that you're going to make money there than versing old mate Tony Bloom or Matthew Benham in the UK who employ hundreds of people and are a shit ton smarter than you. <laughs> yeah, they're all there yeah. trying to take your money. You know, that's yeah. what they're doing. Like on this, so, yeah. you know, it's something to be aware of. Um, I saw a great tweet yesterday, actually, and this is a good example of both middling and um, and player prop markets too. Uh, Manus Labashane, player performance markets, uh, over 92 and a half runs was the line, or over under 92 and a half runs. Uh, 92.5 runs on bet365 the line at top sport which is another bookmaker here in australia was 117.5 and right. at points but it was 120.5 i mean this is a this is a huge middling opportunity yeah. and a huge discrepancy with with like astronomically sized discrepancy um and this will rarely ever happen but uh a bloody good example, and and to be honest, like I know people's biggest problem with uh, with doing player prop bets is you're 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 going to get limited a lot faster because they're smaller markets and they're easier to beat. But I mean, we're talking about the Ashes here. This is a huge huge game. If there's ever a ever a time where maybe a player prop bet's going to sneak underneath the radar, it's probably going to be this one. So I mean, I saw this. I saw this tweet come out from uh, from Wiki AI. <clears throat> Shout out to them on Twitter. Um, I saw this uh, about twenty minutes after play started, so I was filthy. I mean, what a what a chance that would have been, especially uh, if Manus gets out first thing today because he's already on, I think, ninety five runs or something. So then you would have uh, then you would have already you would have got the middle. But yeah, no, good example. Um, all right, mate, we are. Let's go one more topic, mate. Just because uh, I know I know you love your, your in play betting. I think you mentioned this slightly before, but um, yeah, how you can get an edge in play as a final theme we can talk about with the logic of sports bet. Yeah, again, so the, you know this is something obviously traditionally, you know, bookmakers only offer kind of pre game, pre race, you know, bets before an event started. But you know, with the advent of the internet, online online bookmaking, this is something that you know it's kind of exploded, and it's kind of growing proportionally. I'm not sure what the statistics are now. I'm not sure if in play is, is worth more, you know, as uh, of the turnover for bookies, or it will kind of at some point get to that stage. Uh, but again, th thinking about what the bookmaker is trying to achieve there, 
you know, they want people betting as much as possible. You know, you see these adverts, um, well, they stop them now, you know, these adverts of like Ray Winston at half time, you know, encouraging you to bet um yeah. at some shitty odds you know like on something that's never going to happen um and you know all the mugs will go for it but that's what they want you know and and the vast majority of um people again you know they'll, they'll kind of put bets on for the excitement um you know sadly people with gambling issues this is the kind of perfect way to exploit them you know you, you can put one or two bets on a game before a game you know during a game there's kind of countless things you could bet on um you know countless ways they can make money from you the the, the holds are higher um you know the margins higher they, they, they're and they're cheeky the bookmakers you know there is a delay when when you're watching something on on tv it's not kind of live and the bookmakers put a delay on sometimes you ever tried sometimes a bit of betting um you might see you know a circle going round or a kind of delay before it goes through it's because they're basically waiting to see can they offer you a worse price or you know has something happened in the game where it's, you know, it's in their favor um they can either reject your, your bet offer you a worse price or if you're lucky they might give you a decent price but again it's kind of stacked against you so kind of blindly betting in play is kind of you know is, is not a great strategy but understanding how these in-play markets are structured because you've got to think, um, you know, the pre-game models for, for the bookmakers, they have to contain a lot of information, um, you know, and over time they kind of play out that way. In-play uh, in -play models, you know, need to be uh, quite fast you know, and react quite fast. So often there's times where there's key information that might be missed um the let's say the algorithms that are used for for these kind of uh, in play models they might not factor in things you know for example you know an example in the book is um again if a t if a player gets injured you know um and i can relate this to, to football let's say the star striker gets injured um the you know the, the unless that you know the, the the sports book is very on the ball you know the, the odds might not reflect that necessarily um you know straight away and eventually that line could get hammered. Um, weather conditions, for example, you know, let's say during a game, you know, it starts just pouring down with rain, or snow, or whatever. Um, is that model really accounting for that? Mm. So you've got to kind of think outside the box sometimes with these in-play bets. There are opportunities to be found. And if you kind of, um, you know, think about how these models are priced, and if you can understand you know what 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 they miss sometimes then you can find you know really good opportunities um there's i mean if you're fast enough there's you know arbitrage opportunities you can spot big value at one book that's slower maybe they have a slower data feed and sometimes they just get it completely wrong you know they might you know the, the odds will change because someone pressing a button somewhere uh, has given you know has pressed a button to say one team has scored well actually it was the other team um, you know, or the other team scored a try, and so the, the actual score is 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 not what's uh, what's on the data feed. Um, but you know, with that, you might be lucky, you know, to to get those bets through all the time. They can still pout those, and uh, VAR and probably helps there too. If there's a goal that's gone through, they go one nil, and VAR pulls it back. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah. So for example, in the exchange, it's kind of uh, that kind of you know ruined a lot of people's strategies. Um, but again, yeah, you know, you can kind of speculate on that. You know, I'm sure there are sport books where you can, where you can do that. And, um, yeah, so, so really sort of thinking about how you bet in play, there are ways to do it. There are ways to be sophisticated. What you need to be aware of again is sort of historical data. So a lot of the things, I mean, I can give, you know, it's not like a secret to be honest, but you know, it's something you can kind of easily do, but things like, for example, corners, um you know how some bookmakers might model the price on corners is historically you know let's say 10 minutes left if there's one team chasing their odds are around this range they've had five corners already you know how likely are they to get 10 or how likely is it to be 10 corners in this game um because that's you know really the the, the models you know that they, they aren't nuanced enough to account for all the facts in that game but let's say you're watching the game and you're seeing, you know, the manager is, you know, 
put three subs on. They're all strikers. You know, they're going for it. This is like do or die. They need to get that goal. You know, the other team is just sat, stuck in their penalty box. The model isn't computing that. So, mm. so, so these are things where, you know, with your art, trained eye, if you have knowledge of the sport, but not just knowledge of the sport, if you have knowledge of the sport, but also where the historical price should be for that, that's where you can kind of spot the value. And, um, you know, it's a mantra that the, the book really encourages, you know, to kind of try and think for yourself, try and think about where these opportunities lie, understand the data. Like you've said many times before, you know, and, and lots of your guests, you know, the, the, the way you get better at this is studying the markets, you know, just spending lots of time looking at these markets, see how they behave. Uh, and that's where you're going to find these opportunities. And the, also, the good thing as well with in-play bets is, because they're considered, I suppose, more muggy or, you know, like they're, they're not considered as sharp. Yeah. If you find a good strategy in play, you know, that can actually improve your account longevity. So, you know, that's also a good incentive to, to devote some yeah. time and resources to it. Yeah, no, I, I couldn't agree more. I've talked to, to a few people who have, um, yeah, I guess just mixed in live betting with their their normal maybe like trade mate betting or whatever whatever value kind of stuff that they're doing and they've yet noticed that a lot of their accounts are just you know they've had maybe five accounts with the same bookmaker but then the sixth one that they've had they've thrown in their live bet here and there maybe quite regularly actually and yeah next thing you know this account's been going on for three months so um yeah no definitely a a, a good strategy to go by there, mate. And I think that's really a really good point is that I think anyone that has anyone anyone that has really good knowledge of one sport and a decent background in betting, like you really can exploit, you can beat a model, you can beat a computer where, I mean, just think about it. Like there's no way that there's, there's essentially, um, you know, I can't give you an exact number, but there's probably one guy looking after like 20, maybe 10 to 20 football games at once. Like there's no yeah. way that he or she is going to, you know, be able to stay on top of the one game you're watching or whatever you're doing. So there's always going to be opportunities there, especially in live betting, if you're fast enough, smart enough and back yourself. Yeah, 100%. That's great advice. Cool. Mate, I reckon we've done a terrific job there. I've actually really enjoyed that. We uh, we talked a lot about, spent a lot of time in the first half just talking about holds and digs and markets and all that kind of stuff, middling. So I think there is a lot of, uh, a lot of fat to chew on there for people over Christmas and maybe convince them to, to go out and buy this book for themselves or, um, yeah, maybe they want to, educate their missus on sports betting get them the book i mean what a christmas present that would be maybe i should oh, do that yeah, the wives would love it i'm sure imagine the live reaction you get on that <laughs> <laughs> i just want you to understand what i do you know <laughs> just have a read of this <laughs> um but yeah if people enjoyed this um more than happy to do it again there yeah, are open to point- suggestions i mean there's loads of books on you know the bookshelf that I'm, I want to kind of work through, but if anyone's got any ideas, um, you know, more, more than happy to take that on board as well. Yeah, um, definitely. So, yeah, tweet us, comment, whatever, let us know if you, you should give a this. plug as well. So, just just in case anyone does want to buy it, and so we don't get sued by Ed and Matthew for giving them off the book. So, yeah, this is it Logic of Sports Betting, uh, Ed Miller, uh, Matthew Davidow. Um, you know, you can find it. I don't know if you can find it at all good bookshops, but you know, there's a it's a big it's on uh, Amazon, and I'm pretty it's sure it's on Amazon. Amazon. I would say Amazon, okay, yeah, fine, yeah. yeah, it's on Amazon. Um, but you can you, know, you can get it in paperback, you can get it on Kindle, you can get it as an audio book as well. So, if whatever your kind of preferred method is, yeah. like I said before, I did download it as an audio book, and um, you know, it was it was interesting, but I feel like I got the most out of it as a physical paperback that I could kind of scribble down notes. I mean, like if you just kind of see like, you know, it's just, there's just highlighted passages everywhere in this book of, you know, just gems. So yeah, uh, yeah I'd highly, highly recommend it. it. Reading this book, you know, whatever you pay for it is well worth the investment. It'll repay itself over you know many, many times. 
Yeah, no, 100%. All right. Well done, mate. Thank you very much for reading the book, firstly, and yeah, so uh, and, doing, and, yeah. and helping me through that. I don't need to read it anymore. No, I'm joking. That's it, yeah. <laughs> I'm, sure, <laughs> I'm sure there's plenty of good stuff in there that we've missed. Um, but, yeah, as always, thanks for listening, everyone. Have a bloody ripper Christmas. Um, maybe uh, we'll, we'll jump back on sometime after Christmas, take a couple of weeks off, have a little rest, um, and, and be back in the new year. But, yeah, everyone have a great Christmas. If you've got a bit of spare time on your hands, do a quick rate and review of the podcast. That would be terrific. Uh, yeah, comment any uh, questions you have below. Subscribe to us. All the good stuff. And as always, if you're looking to implement some of the strategies we talked about today or on the podcast, um, or sorry, or weekly, um, yeah, start a free week trial of Trade Mate Sports and start your value betting journey. Neil, mate, terrific stuff as always, mate. And we'll uh, catch up soon. Yeah, thank you. My pleasure, Alex. And, you know, thanks for everyone for all the support and, uh, you know, for tuning in. Have a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Merry Christmas, everyone.